What's up, guys? Welcome back. We are here with yet another podcast episode. And in this episode, we are going to continue our discussion of being used in the kingdom of God, using our gifts, using our calling, you finding your place in God's kingdom and in Christ's body. So without further ado, let's jump into this episode. Hey guys, and welcome to another exciting episode of Your Life, God's Word. Thanks for joining this time of relevant conversation and scriptural application, where we apply God's Word to the most important areas of life, God, family, and community. We pray this broadcast inspires, encourages, challenges, and blesses you in every way. So without further ado, let's dive right in to this week's episode. All right, so we we took a break, kind of a one-week break last week. We talked um, with Aaron Besserell about his testimony and struggle with depression and suicide um, in lieu of September being Suicide Prevention and Awareness Month. So if you didn't catch that amazing testimony and, and some of his insights and different things, then you should go watch that. Uh, uh, well, I guess you can't watch it, right? Because this is this is uh, audio only. <laughs> you can listen and envision what it would be like to be watching it. But uh, go check that out. Uh, if you do have any questions, comments, things of that nature, uh, please send them to podcast at breadbreakers.com. Uh, we're, we, we are compiling a list so that we can um, start to do kind of a almost like a mailbag segment in some of these podcast episodes um, and get people's comments and questions answered so that there's a little more discussion and things going on. Also, please share, like, um, and comment on this podcast. If you've got, again, friends, family, fellow church members that, hey, you know what, I'm not sure if they listen to the podcast, but I think this episode would really be great for them, that, you know, whatever it might be, or encouraging or whatever, you've got family and uh, friends that maybe don't even have a relationship with Jesus Christ or don't even uh, attend a church or, or, you know, maybe they, they, they kind of have their own relationship, but they, you know, they're not connected with a body of Christ or not active in, in the body of Christ with a local assembly. Um, and, and again, right, these are all people that we need to be reaching out to. And one way to do that very easily and nonchalantly is say, hey, I listened to a great podcast. Uh, hey, I wanted to get your thoughts on this, or hey, take a listen to this. Tell me what you think. It's super easy. You're doing just a half a percent of the work and letting somebody else do all the work of putting together the podcast and everything. So again, share, like, comment, get it all over the place um, so that we can help as many people as possible. Content like last week with suicide prevention and awareness, content like what we're going through here, it's stuff that even sometimes people that have been in, you know, quote unquote, in church, going to church um, for decades, really need to hear and sometimes have never really heard in this way, in this context. And so, again, let's reach out to these people. Um, I may put this podcast together today, but I need your help to get it out there and get it in front of the people that need it most. So last time we um, we discussed Romans chapter 12, just kind of, um, you know, some a portion of that chapter, kind of going through it and really diving in. We're going to do the same thing with 1 Corinthians chapter 14 uh, this time around. Um, so opening up, I'm reading from the NIV, and I'm just going to kind of go through, comment, and try to try to try to break this down to help people to find your place in your calling in the kingdom of God, right? And so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time going through some of the general stuff or um, or the things we did last time. Go listen to the, the podcast um, of part one where we start talking about these things and go through Romans. So in, in Romans, we, we did kind of what I would call some of the functional gifts. There were some spiritual gifts mixed in there as well, but we we talked a little bit more about gifts that people don't think about, things like mercy, right? Things like uh, administration, things like government. 
and uh, leading, that kind of stuff. So this time we're going into 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And I said 14, but I didn't mean 14. I actually meant chapter 12. So I apologize for that. It is <laughs> 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Maybe I haven't had enough coffee today. I don't know. Or maybe I had too much. You just can't get these things right sometimes. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12. This is where people talk about the, the nine, right, quote-unquote, nine spiritual gifts. I'm not going to get into that discussion, okay? He, he does list nine of them, so we'll, we'll go with nine. That, that's, that's irrelevant, really. The point is to dive in and be used in your calling and gifting in God. So he opens up with, uh, he being Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 1. Now, about spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know, so right there, right? I don't want you to be ignorant about these things. Notice, notice something here that just jumped out at me. He doesn't just say, well, just pray and go and operate. No, he says, listen, I don't want you to be ignorant, right? And the implication is, therefore, I mean, he's got a bunch of writing here, right? A bunch of more words. The implication is, now I'm going to teach you about things of the spiritual being used in your calling and gifting. There is a class of folks out there, um, there, you know, a group of people, probably a fairly large group, actually, that a lot of times when you get into things like teaching about the gifts, teaching about stuff, oh, no, 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 you don't need teaching. You, you know, the Bible isn't, it's kind of irrelevant here. We just flow along in the Spirit. No, you don't. Absolutely not. That's how you get crazy. That's how you get kooky. That's how you get to where the average Christian, when you start talking to them, they're not weirded out with the fact that God moves and there's a powerful spiritual realm and all this stuff. They're weirded out because you are weird, right? They're, they're, not, they're not weirded out because of the concept. They read the Bible. They're fine with the concept. They're fine with spiritual gifts. They're weird because you make it weird, okay? And that's, that's not what we want. It's quote-unquote weird enough, especially to a worldly-minded person or to a, um, a worldly-minded Christian or to a Christian who is turned off to these things or taught that these things are not for today, which is incorrect and wrong. Um, you know, but again, let's learn. Let's be taught. Let's develop. Um, you know, I, I mentioned 1 Corinthians 14. We're not going through that. But he does, uh, Paul does... Um, say, right, at the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 39 says, therefore, my brothers, be eager to prophesy. I mean, want it, go for it, do it, you know, it's great. And do not forbid speaking in tongues, right? I mean, how many churches do that? Forbid speaking in tongues. We don't want speaking in tongues in this prayer meeting. How dare you, you know, be preaching, teaching, and, and a tongue come over you or, you know, you, and again, right, it's not that it controls you, you have control of it, but you feel to pray, oh, I'm going to Pray in tongues right now. I'm gonna, oh my gosh, no, 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 you can't do that. That's crazy. This is what a lot of churches do. Those churches are out of order. If you're going to a church like that, you need to go to the pastor. You need to start asking solid questions. And if they won't answer, or if they don't have good answers, then you need to leave that place, okay? You need to follow God and not man. Um, again, you got questions on that? Podcast at breadbreakers.com. Love to sit down with you, have some coffee. Let's chat. Let's talk. Let's learn. Let's grow and develop. Um, <clears throat> but don't forbid speaking in tongues. Here we, here's the kicker in verse 40, though. But everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. Right? Everybody coming on in, right? He talks about people come together. Everybody's got a tongue. Everybody's got a message. Everybody's got a song. There's nothing wrong with all of that. People ha have different ministries, and they want to minister, and they want to do things. But it needs to be done fitting and in order. Sometimes in order is not you standing up and doing your ministry right now. Right? Because why? Well, you know, practically. Well, we've we've got somebody who has heard from God and they have a message that they're gonna they're they're in the middle of teaching, and now you have a tongue come on you or you have a prophetic word that you want to jump up and shout out, you are out of order. Okay? You're disrupting what's going on. That person is up teaching, delivering the heart of God, right? Hopefully, right? They were praying and they got this from prayer, not some website somewhere. Um <clears throat> right. <laughs> Uh, but let's just say that's a given. They are delivering. They are prophesying now, right? They are giving what God wants the congregation to have, and you can hold on, right? Maybe even 
coordinate with them, right? The service is, is coming to a close. Maybe you have an altar call. Maybe you don't, whatever it is. You, you kind of go to an elder, go to, go to someone and go to that, that preacher and say, hey, I've got something that actually goes right along with what you are saying. You know, here, here's what it is. Do you want to say this to the congregation? Would you like me to? Is this the right time? Should we, you know, th- th- this is how the church should work. And we have lots of times here at Breadbreakers, right, where we have a prophetic word. We have people in prayer see things, visions, uh, things from God, dreams, whatever it might be, uh, tongues and interpretation, right? But we try to do things decently in order. We don't want to clamp that down and not have it, but we do not want people to be weirded out just for weirdness sake, okay? So, you know, somebody is going to prophesy. We don't need to, like, oh, this person's got a pro- prophetic word. Turn the lights off. Start the smoke machine. Now we, we're bringing out some some um, giant uh, uh, cloth uh, robe or something we're going to put on them because when we have people prophesy, we put this giant robe on them and they, you know, what? Where is that coming from in scripture? Why do we need to do that? Let, let's, let's take all the weirdness out and just let God be God. Um, I'm not, I've never seen that happen, but I can imagine that probably does happen at places. Um, so again, right. I don't want you to be ignorant. I want you to be taught about these things. Verse two of chapter 12. Now going back to chapter 12, of 1 Corinthians, you know that when you were pagans, right, back when you were in the world, somehow or other you were influenced and led astray to mute idols, right? You were worshiping things that were not proper. Um, other places he talks about these, you know, these things being really demons. Um, verse 3, therefore I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, practically, if you walk up to your atheist professor at college and you say, hey, I'd like you to repeat these words and I'll give you uh, $10,000 if you do. Just say Jesus is Lord. And they're like, whoa, 10000 bucks. That sounds good. All right, Jesus is Lord. Is he saying right here that you can't say those words? The only way you can put those three words in a row, Jesus is Lord, is if, you, if you're moved on by the Holy Spirit? No, that's not what he's saying. Come on. How can someone possibly think that? But yet, people do try to argue notions just like that. Okay? What, what, is the, what do those words mean? Jesus is Lord. See, it's more than repeating that phrase. Okay? It is a spiritual understanding of who Jesus is and putting him in his rightful place by the Spirit of God, right? Now, he already is in that place. When I say putting him, I mean in your life, right? The reality that Jesus is Lord of the cosmos, the the Lord of the earth, the Lord of the spiritual realms, doesn't really affect you all that much until you put right? By the Holy Spirit, you say, the one sitting on the throne of my life is Jesus Christ. He is L-O-R-D of my life, my home, right? In Romans, when he says, you know, talks about being saved and confessing that Jesus is Lord. Well, in confessing that Jesus is Lord, that means what? That means something, You're going to do something. What are you going to do when Jesus is Lord of your life? You are going to obey his commands. So by saying Jesus is Lord, how can you be saved just by saying that? You're not. You're saved by doing it. You're saved by believing it and acting that out, James chapter 2, where belief is not enough, faith is not enough, right? Right? Unless it's true biblical faith, which leads to action. See, we are big on confessing. We're big on just saying, spouting out nonsense that we don't even really believe. We say we believe, and we kind of knowledge-wise we do, but we don't live it, right? It's only when we live it, when we do it, when it applies to us, that it makes actual impact, okay? So the way you're saved in Romans 10 by confessing is, oh, okay, Jesus is Lord of your life? Yes. All right. Well, here's a bunch of stuff that Jesus said to do. Start doing it. That's how it works, okay? 
happy to discuss that as well with anyone, um, because that's not the point here. The point is that the Holy Spirit, right, you're not going to say, by the Holy Spirit, Jesus be cursed, and it's by the Holy Spirit that you say, Jesus is Lord, okay? There are different kinds, is verse 4, different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit, okay? It's the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. So lots of different things going on. Lots of them. Okay. He's going to he's going to give like nine sort of categories, but there's tons of stuff. And it may not some ways that people operate may not fit nicely and cleanly into one of these categories that somebody wrote about in some book. But that's that's not, you know, the point is not to limit God here. The point is to say there's all kinds of stuff. Now I'm going to give you some basic some basic knowledge, some general understanding. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. Verse 7, Now, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. This is incredibly important. The reason the Spirit shows up in these different giftings, right? We're going to talk about prophecy or, or uh, miracles. or The reason is for the common good. It's for people to be blessed. It's for the service of the kingdom. It is not for your showmanship. It is not for you. It is not so you get to do what God called you to do. Well, maybe right now it's not going to be good for people for you to just do that right now. Let's wait a minute. Let's step back and make sure this is God. Let, this is why he goes in you know chapter in chapter 13 and talks about love needs to be our motivation. And then in chapter 14, it, everything needs to be done decently in order. Why does he even need those chapters? Because people do stuff out of selfish ambition. People do things out of ignorance. People do things without wisdom. People do things because they don't know, understand timing in God. That, I, that's three I can spout out right now with, with no notes. Okay. I have no notes in front of me. I have the Bible in front of me. I'm just letting God flow, and if it's uh, if it's good, it's God. If it, if it's not, that that was me slipping in there. Okay. <laughs> um. So the common good. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. You need to have your brothers and sisters in mind whenever you step out to minister, whenever you step out to do your quote-unquote calling, you need to have the common good of other people at the forefront of your mind, heart, and spirit. And again, the next chapter, the common good, and it needs to be love-driven. The point of pointing at someone and saying you need to repent, for instance— needs to be that they actually repent. You want them to repent. You want them to come to God. The point of confronting a brother, right, according to what Jesus said we're supposed to be doing. What is that, Matthew 18, I think it is. Um, According to how Jesus said to do it, go to them, right? What's the point? The point's reconciliation, though. The point's not, I'm right, you're wrong. The point's not, you did me wrong, and I just want to be heard. I want want to tell my story. I want somebody to to tell my story story about what somebody did to me. Okay? That's not the point. Why? Well, first of all, telling your story is kind of boring if you're going directly to the person, right? And they already know the story, and it's just between the two of you. What? What's the point? The point is reconciliation, a motivation of love. At the end of the day, let's be reconciled. Let's love. Somebody legitimately hurt you, did horrible things, Is love and the common good your motivation? So, verse 8. To one there is given, through the Spirit, the message of wisdom. Other translations, the word of wisdom, right? To another, the message or word of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy to another distinguishing between spirits or discerning of spirits, right? To another speaking in different kinds of tongues. To still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same spirit, and he gives them to each one as he determines. So a lot of there to to unpack, this is the nine gifts, right? A word of wisdom, right? 
what is wisdom? Because he, he goes on to knowledge, right? Wisdom and knowledge. And we're actually doing a, a series right now, just this week, um, on, the, uh, on the YouTube channel, right? Uh, talking about wisdom, right? Foolishness, knowledge. And, you know, the difference between wisdom and knowledge, real quick, right? Wisdom is the proper use of knowledge. No, knowledge, you know something. Wisdom, what do you do with what you know? So there are definitely times that word of wisdom, word of knowledge can work hand in hand. And God might give the two of those to the same person, right? He might tell someone, right? Listen, as you're praying for someone or you just you, you look at someone and God gives you a, a word of knowledge and you know, you just know, right, that in their past uh, they've had a disappointment in their job. I'm just using an example, right? You've had disappointment in, in your job, um, and God has uh, revealed this to me that you've, you've, you've gone for promotions before and it's not happened, right? That may be all God gives that person. It may be all God gives you about the word of knowledge, just knowing that fact, right? But then God may give someone else, right? So let's say two people are praying with this person, and someone says, listen, ha- you know, have you ever had like disappointment in your job or you haven't gotten a promotion, right? That's one way to do it. Another way to do it is just straight up say, hey, God just showed me that, you know, in your past you've um, you've had disappointment. You, you've you gone for promotions in your job haven't had it, haven't, and, they, and they haven't panned out. Um, these are the types of things that when, it's, again, some brand new person comes in and somebody that doesn't know them tells them this, they are going to what? Immediately go, hold up. God is real. Okay, if that person who's operating gives the glory to God and doesn't start, ooh, I'm something, right, and has the common good, right, maybe that person, that's all they say. That's all God showed me. Is that correct? Is that right? Let's just say they say, yes, that's, that's, that's absolutely correct. Now, the second person that's there, right, that's praying with them, um, gets, gets a word and says, God wants you the next time you're up for promotion, God wants you to walk in with confidence in Him, trust in Him to get you that promotion. That right there, right? Wisdom. What do you do? Okay, what do we do with this knowledge? What do we hand in hand? I've seen where uh, the atmosphere in a service is just kind of doobie down. I mean, the worship team's trying, pushing, you know, and no again, people aren't people are not connecting. People and God might give that worship leader, hey, what needs to happen right now is we need to go off script. This is the song that needs to happen. God wants this move. Let's do this. Or maybe just, hey, people are people are distracted and God, God wants um, them to be focused. Let's stop the singing. Let's just all stand right now. Let's lift our hands. Now, again, that could be directly from God. Such a practical thing. But isn't God a practical God? Why does everything have to be crazy, kooky nonsense? It's not, <laughs> you know? And so again, this is just stuff that I, I'm just throwing, I'm spitballing here, right? I've seen lots of this stuff operate over the years, and I'm just giving you an example and trying to give a generic one that I, that's not specific because um, I don't want to put anybody on the spot or whatever. So again, verse 9, right, talks about the uh, gifts of healing, right? Gifts of healing. Right, gift of uh, uh, working of miracles or miraculous powers. Right, I've seen most of this stuff happen. Not not necessarily through me, but uh, in meetings, in prayer, in in church services, in Bible studies. Right, After you pray and, and a prophetic word goes forth. Or um, we need to be ready to operate in these things. You see, but God needs people who are looking for the common good, operating in love and willing to do the hard work of being in relationship with him consistently, right? There's a lot of things that have to go into this. Um, Just a side note here. Look at the, look, all over the Bible, it's automatically assumed that people are going to be meeting together. You see that? You notice that? Now, a lot of people, oh, your church is, you don't necessarily need to meet together. It's me and my, my, me on my room praying to God, right? No. The body of Christ is supposed to be meeting together. How are you giving, how are you doing a miracle for someone if you're not around someone? 
how is it that you are you know out you're giving this word of knowledge word of wisdom right if you're not around people, if you're not operating, well, that that means on the job. That means hitting the street. Yeah, I believe that. But uh, again, aren't your brothers and sisters in Christ supposed to be the first recipients of much of the operating of the Spirit? Well, Galatians says, do good to all people, especially those of the household of faith. So again, there's, there's this anticipation that there's going to be, there's meetings. People are coming together, right? <laughs> So that's just a side note here. And, and again, I don't want to get super deep and try to figure out, oh, what do the, all these giftings mean and what are they? But because what happens is we can narrow God down. Oh, uh, miracles means this. Well, what about this thing over here? Well, it doesn't really fit nicely. The point is we need to operate and expect God to do powerful things. We need to expect God to do the miraculous things that we cannot do. Somebody walks in with a broken ankle and we pray and expect God to fix it. Somebody comes in with cancer, and we pray and expect God to heal. Does God do it 100% of the time? He didn't do it 100% of the time in the Bible. Why is, why is Paul telling Timothy, take, take some wine for your, your stomach's sake and your, con, and your often infirmities? Why didn't God just heal him? Right? Um, uh, the <laughs> you know, that again, that messes up people's theology sometimes. Um <sighs> A, who was the person that that Paul left sick? The, the Bible actually says, it's Trophimus. Yeah, Trophimus, uh, 2 Timothy 4.20. He says, Trophimus, I left sick at Miletus, right? Well, here Paul is, right? Paul is here with a guy, and he left him there sick. Now, are, are, do you really think Paul didn't pray for the guy to get healed? Oh, you're sick. Oh, that stinks. Well, I'm off. I'm going over here. Right? So God does not, it's not 100% of the time. Right? Jesus was 100%, but Jesus, he was walking around with full, complete, absolute knowledge of, of, of the will of God at all times. Like, he knew exactly who God was going to heal and who he was not. He knew exactly what God wanted to do in every situation, 100% of the time, with 100% accuracy and perfection. That is not us. We are not, we are, we are not Jesus, okay? <laughs> and so we see through a glass darkly. We, we operate in part, which, um, of course, Paul goes on in this discussion and says, we have to remember Chapter 12 doesn't stop in the new topic on 13. This is a letter just written openly. So that's why he goes on and explains some of this stuff. So I'm going to go on. Verse 12 of chapter 12 says, The body is a unit, though it's made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. Right? So another reason why believers need to get together is that you don't have everything, right? You might have, in my example, you might be on the job, and God gave you this word of knowledge, but now where do we go from here? What do we do with this? Now, we can make something up, or we can go into, I'm saying something, but but I'm acting like God also said this. Very few people do this, right? Here's what God said, and, I, and here's here, I'm not getting this from God, but here's what I think we should do with this. But we should be very comfortable doing that. We should never put our words in God's mouth. That, friends, is taking the place of God, and he will judge us accordingly. We need to be very careful when we're operating in the Spirit. If there's a distinction that we know, this was, this was God, this was not, I'm not even sure, right? Even if you're not sure, do not take I'm not sure and make it like, well, this is what God said. Very dangerous. Very dangerous, okay? But you get that word of knowledge, and somebody else in the body is operating in word, in word of wisdom, or um, maybe you get a, wor a word of knowledge about a, uh, a, a, an, an, an infirmity that somebody has, an ailment, a disease. God has revealed to me that you are suffering from, you know, from, from bone cancer, right? And maybe there's somebody in the congregation that literally has been gifted, you know, a, a, a healing power over bone cancer or over cancer, you know, altogether. Well, wouldn't it be nice to have that person with you after you got that word of knowledge? But what are you going to be doing when you're just on the streets 
and you have no body to connect with, you have you don't even have a, a, a network, you don't have a body, okay? Because you by yourself, you're not the body. It's all of us coming together. So again, you know, just wanted to reiterate the point that I just made earlier. Uh, continuing on, so it is with Christ, right? For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we're all given the one spirit to drink. Now, a lot of times we focus on the one spirit to drink. Woo, glory to God, speaking in tongues, man, praying in the spirit, receiving that Holy Ghost. That is one of the most powerful experiences you'll ever have. So I'm not trying to make light of it. But what happens is we focus on that so much that we forget that he said, yeah, that same spirit that you're drinking of, that same spirit that he goes on in chapter 14 to say that when you're praying in tongues, or, or the Bible says praying in the spirit sometimes, um, or praying in tongues, that those are interchangeable. When the Bible talks about people praying in the spirit, they, are, they mean praying in tongues. That it's very obvious from the scriptures that that's what they mean, when, especially when you study 1 Corinthians chapter 14. So it's a powerful experience. We need to be doing it. It edifies. The, the Spirit prays through us. We build, we build ourselves up in God. We're praying directly to God, all this stuff, right? But, but what about the first part of this? We are baptized into a body. We become part of the body of Christ, okay? We become part of the body of Christ when we are filled with that Spirit, right? I don't know. A toe? Are we the spleen? Are we the left lung and somebody else is the right lung? Are we a part of the lung, right? Are, are we a, an eye, part of the... Right? You see what I'm saying? But, 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 but what good is a hand sitting there in a chair? We need all the body coming together, right? Working together, and the only way to do this is if we actually incorporate. If, right, and I don't mean legally incorporate, I mean come together, right? If we actually fellowship, if we're actually in community. That's the only way it works. And the again, you can read all the epistles. It's an understood thing that the body of Christ is going to be coming together and everybody's going to be working and, and actively moving and flowing in their calling. Because so when we all come together, hopefully we can be the body of Christ. And so we can have... It like Jesus is there present. Be, why? Because we have all these people in all these different callings and giftings, focused, praying, locked into the Spirit, um, flowing together, and that's that's the picture he's painting here, right? We're all coming together. We are all one one body, right? And that happens by what? By the Spirit baptized into that body. How? By the Spirit. Verse 14, now the body is not made up of one part, but many. He reiterates it again. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, cease to be part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, cease to be part of the body. Right? If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body was a, were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact... God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wants them to be or wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. So he hits that, I don't have this ministry, or I don't have that ministry, or I wish I could do that, or I wish I had this, or I wish... No, you are important in what God has called you to do. So, you know, somebody over here is working a miracle, blind eyes being open, and you don't have any miracles in your ministry whatsoever. That does not mean that your ministry is any less important to what they are doing. Because what good is it for somebody, and the Bible actually says this, right? Jesus said, better to pluck out your eye and go into eternal life than to be whole and go into eternal damnation. And so maybe that person is fantastic. They are awesome. They're using their gifting. Their, their miracles are happening, healing, whatever it might be. But God has gifted you in teaching. Or God has gifted you in the gift of mercy, to, to love people in the everyday, when they're in the hospital, right? When they're, when they're sick at home, you have a heart to go and visit them, take them food, love on them, right? Because I'll tell you this right now, somebody can get healed of blindness, somebody can have terminal cancer, and then start 
again, attending worship services at a specific church. And over, you know, maybe a year, a couple of years, right? That, that, that testimony is still awesome, but it was five years ago. And right now, today, they're going to that same church, and there's no love. They were sick, and nobody, nobody came and ministered to them, right? They were in trouble and need. Nobody reached out to them. And they can start to grow cold toward that body of Christ, which often leads to people growing, growing cold toward God. And then they can turn around and die lost in their sin, free from cancer, but full of unforgiveness and bitterness that was brought on by an unloving church that didn't have people who were ministering as the hands and feet of Christ. And so again, I can I could go on and on and on with examples like that. You are important. Your calling is crucial. It is critical to the body of Christ. And so you need to have confidence and faith. I can't heal a wart on the backside of a frog. But I operate in my calling and gifting. And there's nothing wrong with praying, you know, God, I, I'm operating in mine, but I'd love to have that in my ministry. Or, you know, I, I can't teach worth, worth a lick, you know, and I, but I'd love, to, I'd love to be able to. But maybe God's going to go, no, no, that's not for you. Or maybe he'll say, all right, here you go. Here's what's going to be required to grow into that. Okay, you, you, we need to be, again, confident in who we are in God. Thank God that he's using us in whatever capacity and go and be used. Then he hits the next section, verse 21. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. The head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker or in, are indispensable, like I just said. Because in the everyday, I'm just going to say it again, I've been pastoring a number of years, I've seen most of the, probably all of the nine gifts of the Spirit in operation. Um, I've operated in a couple of them, but again, I, I, I am not the guy that does all, I, I'm not, I'm not. I'll sit there and there's times I just step back and let somebody go run the show, man, and I'm happy to do so because it's great to see people operating in their calling and I do not want everything being on my shoulders. <laughs> Hallelujah, thank you God for that. But I'm going to tell you right now, over the years, I've seen the big stuff, we need it. It is crucial. We need the power gifts. We need somebody to be able to come up and their leg gets healed miraculously right there on the spot. But if I had to pick, if I had to choose, do you want all of that and not have the behind-the-scenes ministry that goes on, the community ministry that goes on? Or would you, re I'm telling you, <laughs> I'm getting emotional, <laughs> I'm telling you right now, or you can have a body of Christ that loves people to the fullest. They are there for them. They are community. When their kid is sick, they feel it. They're reaching out. They're loving them. When, when someone is in need, that body is praying. When, 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 when things, I'm telling you, when there's a financial problem, the church binds together and says, you know what, you're a hard worker. This is a crazy thing that's happened. We're going to pay your rent for the next three months so you get back on your feet. I'm here to tell you, if I had to choose, if I had to choose, I would choose that one. Because that's the one that's going to have lasting impact. I have watched, I know, I have a friend <laughs> that heard the, aud folks, the audible voice of God speak speak to him in a meeting in a we'll call it a conference and say if you don't get right right now tonight i am done with you something to that effect ran to the altar prayed through today years later backslid away from god living in sin i am here to tell you the big things i believe they're necessary i pray for them i want them i want miracles signs and wonders i want big stuff like that but i'm here to tell you it is in the consistency of the mundane. It is in the operation of the every day. That is what keeps people. And that is why I'm telling you this because I know from experience what we should believe and know from Scripture. But sometimes Scripture just seems like, oh, well, you know, Paul. No, I'm telling you right now. When Paul says, when Paul says those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. He spoke that 
by the Holy Spirit, and I guarantee he had experience in this, watching people get a miraculous, unbelievable arm grow back and then turn around and lift that arm up in the face of God and say, where were you when I needed you? And it was because somebody didn't visit them when they were sick. Now, verse 22, on the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. Whew. Verse 23, and the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment, right? When you're out there doing a miracle, you're in the limelight. People are slapping you on the back. Woo, man. What a, or if you're preaching a powerful message, it was from God. It was awesome. It was, it was indeed powerful. It was teaching that was straight from God. Prophecy all over. It was amazing. But guess what? Everybody heard it. Everybody was patting you on the back afterwards. Everybody was texting you. Everybody was, you know, hitting that, that like button on Facebook. What a powerful message by you know, Pastor so-and-so today. And I'm telling you, that's fine. That's fine. Sometimes it's nice to know after you got done preaching and, and pouring out your heart that people received it and, and people were changed. And, and <laughs> that's great. But guess what? You know who doesn't get a lot of that limelight? That person who was just consistent and faithful and loving people. You didn't even know what they were doing. I, I heard about somebody recently who was taking meals to people, right? People getting COVID, people getting sick, flu going around. I didn't even know. <laughs> they've been visiting people and go, go in and taking them food. And I'm just like, wow, that's awesome. What an, what an amazing thing, right? Those things are indispensable if we're trying to build a true church, if we're trying to build community, ecclesia, if we're, try, <laughs> if we're trying to do that. Now, if you're just trying to have a miracle ministry, they're, then, they're, they're, then they are dispensable, right? But God is not interested in your miracle ministry. He's interested in the ecclesia, right? He is interested in the church being built, community, right? That's what he's interested in. So then he goes on, if the whole body were an ear, where would this, I'm sorry, <laughs> I lost my place. But God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lacked it so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. When somebody is getting the kudos for that miracle that was done, and you know the only reason that person was even there to have a miracle done was because you were working with them for three stinking years, and they finally showed up, and this guy gets all the credit. You should rejoice that the will of God was done, that that person receive what they need? <laughs> is, that how, is that what we do? And the person doing the miracle needs to give honor and respect and put the person that brought that, that, those, that, those crowds in the limelight. Thank you so much for doing your, your part. I was in prayer all this time, uh, seeking the face of God, being humble in relationship with God so I could have this miracle ministry. But what good would a miracle ministry be with nobody here to get the miracle? So thank you, everybody that was out there loving on people and working with people and inviting people, not invite them to get them here, but thank you, thank you, thank you for operating in your ministry, because if you weren't operating in yours, I could not operate in mine. Sorry, again, I'm getting emotional with this because I've seen it operate, and I feel what Paul is saying here. I feel, I sense the heart of Paul in this thing. Just because you don't have a ministry in the spotlight, you are so crucial. Don't you understand? The church cannot, cannot survive without that ministry. Now, if you walk away, God will fill it with somebody else. You got a miracle ministry and you say, well, I'm out of here. God will give it to somebody else. Okay, so don't make any mistake to think that God needs you specifically. No, he needs that gift operating. You and I need God. He does not need us. He does not need me personally. If I step away from God, he will have somebody else fill the ministries that I am called to do. Make no mistake about that. But the ministry is critical, and therefore you are critical. If you will do your ministry, do it with love, do it with passion, do it with purpose. Know that's what you're called to do, and never feel less than just because you're not on a stage with a microphone. That's a function of our society. 
That's a function of our society, not a function of the church, not a function of the kingdom. And if you're in a church that that is how they operate, I am here to tell you they are not operating fully as the church God called them to be. Maybe you should share this podcast with your pastor, and then I would love to get some coffee with them. And if they're open to change and open to to, to being what God wants them to be, let's do it. I'll be happy to work with somebody for weeks and months and years to, 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 to change and become the ecclesia that God wants us to be. But if they won't, then you need to go to a place that will operate as the church. And on the flip side, You've got that miracle ministry. You've got that preaching and teaching crazy awesome in the limelight. You can sing it up. You're a, a worship leader that, that basically fell straight out of heaven, <laughs> just smashed into the ground on the earth, rose up with a beautiful song on your lips. Again, I'm being facetious, but that again, there are people with this, I believe, with the, the ministry of the Old Testament minstrel, right? They, it is a calling of God. 25 other people can sing that same song, and not have that same move of God. Why? Because when that person opens their mouth, yes, it's beautiful, yes, it's talented, great, awesome, but when they open their mouth, there is an anointing that flows out that gets chains broken by the Spirit. And I'm here to tell you right now, if you're a worship pastor, you're a worship minister, you want to get into these ministries, you need to take it seriously. Don't let some church turn you into nothing more than a showpiece to get people there so you can get their money and you can get their behinds in the seats. You need to not settle for anything less than the power of God flowing through your ministry. That is what God called you to do. He didn't call you. He didn't call you to amass crowds and money. Now, crowds and money may come. That is, There's no problem with that. God is, not, God is okay with that. But if you are hindered in your ministry, if you are shackled and chained by leaders saying you will do it this way, you will not let the Spirit of God flow, we are on a time crunch, where that kind of stuff is not from God. You need to escape while you still can, lest you fall into damnation because you failed to do what God told you to do. Now, I'm here to tell you, a worship ministry is in the limelight. It's up there on the stage. It's easy to get proud. It's easy to get get these things in our spirit that will damn our soul to hell. And so we got to be in special prayer. We got to be in special we have to be in special relationship with God. We got to watch our minds. We got to watch our hearts. I I do these ministries. So I'm I'm telling you. I know from experience. You have to you you have to guard yourself. Please, God, don't let me get a big head. Oh, God, I preached and power happened and people were changed. Don't let me get a big head. Don't, don't help me. You you sang and the house, I mean, it erupted in, in, in worship and people were changed. There was healing that happened right there while you were while you were singing and letting God flow. Don't get filled with pride. Don't start, well, now I'm something. I'm gonna go to the pastor and tell him, you know what? I think I need to start changing my schedule around here. I'm something and I need to do not do that. Serve, 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 serve. What is this talking about? What is this chapter about? It's about the common good. It's about operating in love. It's about us doing our ministry. And so we should not get a big head. I'm in the limelight. I don't need all you people out here doing your little ministries that nobody knows about. No, we need each other. We are critical. We are crucial. You are special. You are called. Do what God called you to do. That's the point. You, we, we should do a better job. I, we try to do a better job around here at Bread Breakers with ministries that are not so in the limelight, constantly giving honor to, to, to things like cleaning the church. Nobody wants to come in and sit on a dirty toilet, but how many people come in thinking about that? No, we're thinking about the worship team up there. We're thinking about the, right? But, but we, we try. I don't know that we do, you know, a hundred percent perfect job, but we try to do what he's saying here. Give honor, give honor. I'm doing it right now on the podcast. Hopefully people listen to it. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Mom, for being one of the people that listen to it, right? Um, verse 27, he says, Now you are the body of Christ, and each of you, <clears throat> or each one of you is a part of it. You are a part. Don't you understand? Think about that. Get that in your spirit. I am a part of Christ's body in the earth. Do you realize how special that place is? Do you realize how anointed and powerful? Whoo! Wow. Amazing. Verse 28, and in the church, God has appointed first 
of all. Apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers, then workers of miracles. Also, those having gifts of healing, those able to help others. Look at that. He lists helps right there. Those gifts with administration, those speaking different types of tongues. He, he, he crunches some of these things together, puts them right alongside each other. Are all apostles in, verse, in chapter 29? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But eagerly desire the greater gifts. What are the greater gifts? The greater gifts is the gift that God needs right now. God doesn't need that miracle ministry right now when all someone needs is a loving arm over their shoulders and an empathetic word from God. I'm here with you. I know what you're going through. Okay? He doesn't need your, I can heal the blinded eye. That person, they're not blind. They're, they, need, they need someone operating in the gift of mercy. When somebody walks up and needs healing... They don't necessarily need a sermon preached at them right now, even though that might be a powerful word. It's a word from God, but they don't need that right now. Guess, guess who needs to step up? That person that has authority and power over that sickness or someone who just operates in a general, right, general gifts of healing. We need them to get healed right now. That's the need. The greater gifts, the greatest gifts, the great, because what, what, what does that mean, greater, right? What does that mean? Greater? Greater? Right? Not greater in importance in general. Greater in need at the time. Right? When we're talking direction for the church, church governance issues, who do we need to step up? Apostles. We need elders and deacons to come together and pray and seek the mind of God, the face of God. Right? But when we're Determining which neighborhood do we hit God. I'd like to have an evangelist and a, and, and a prophet praying together and get the word, this neighborhood is ready for God to come. Right? And that's what I would prefer. What's the most important right, gift? It's the one that's needed at the time. And then he goes on, the final phrase of this chapter, and now I will show you the, mo the most excellent way or a more excellent way. And this is, again, where he goes into chapter 13, and he talks about, I can speak with tongue of men and angels, don't have love, right? What am I? Resounding gong, clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy, I can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, I can move mountains, but I have not love, I'm nothing. If I, if I give, look at this, right? Giving and charity, but that's not motivated by love, right? It's motivated by getting your name on that on that plaque or people seeing it or just because, well, I guess I'm supposed to do good deeds, right? And there's lots of motivations other than love. He says in verse three, if I give all I possess, every dime, every nickel, every penny to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. And of course, you can read that chapter on your own, but he, what is he saying? Love has to be the principal thing. Love has to be the thing that motivates that miracle. It has to be the thing that motivates that gift of mercy. Not just, well, I'm just going to do this because no, it, it, love needs to be the motivator. Love needs to be the thing that drives us. And I'm here to tell you, love needs to be the thing that motivates us to get off our couch, come out of our house, get together with the body of Christ. Well, or, or maybe it's a gathering at your house. So I guess maybe get up off the couch and have church at your house. But you know what I'm saying? I am saying to you that is listening to this podcast, I need you. You need me. We are all a part of of the body of Christ. We need each other to come together and work together to be what God has called us to be. When Sunday morning rolls around, we should not have the attitude that, well, maybe I'll be there, maybe I won't. The attitude should be there's a gathering of the people of God. They need me there because I'm operating in this specific, whatever, maybe it's one, two, three, five, ten. I don't care. Even if it's just one thing, they need me there. When the attitude is I may or may not show up, you know what that tells me? That tells me you don't understand who you are. You are not operating in your calling. And you need a fresh drink of the Holy Spirit. You are important. You are necessary. You are critical. You must operate and where in the position that God has called you to be. 
You are critical. You are necessary. You, <laughs> I'm saying it again. You are important. You must find your place in God's kingdom and Christ's body. I love you. God bless you. I really, truly hope that this message encourages and helps somebody, somebody to be who they were meant to be in God.